Hello everyone and welcome back. Now, in this video I want to talk about the wave equation again and the method of characteristics as it applies to the wave equation. But what I would like to do is I would like to ask if I don't have an infinite line, but a semi-infinite line. So for example, we're going to look at it a situation where you only have one boundary. And what happens whenever those waves that are moving left and right from, the, from D'Alembert's solution to the wave equation bump up against that boundary. What should we expect? So, for example, or let's look at the wave equation again. Our usual starting point for now. Uh, minus c squared partial squared u partial x squared is equal to zero. And let's look at, again, for the wave equation, we need initial conditions. G of x here. But also, let's look at a boundary condition, OK? So I'm going to look at one pinned boundary here. So there's two ways that you can interpret this, OK? So in this case, x is going to be greater than 0. You could think about this as a sort of infinitely long line with just one boundary. But really, the interpretation here is just asking ourselves what happens at each boundary. You could put a second boundary on this thing to make it much more realistic. But for, for the sake of mathematics, we just want to investigate the effect of boundaries. Let's just keep it simple and look at one boundary individually. Putting, more, uh, putting a second boundary on here will have the same effect on the other side. It'll mirror this effect. So let's just work with one for the time being. So we've got a semi-infinite line, all of the positive real numbers. And again, so D'Alembert tells us, D'Alembert gives us the solution that we can decompose the partial differential equation into a right word and a tr uh, left word traveling wave or a, a propagating wave solution. And of course, where we have the following, where, so let's say where, uh, let's say g of x is equal to 1 half f of x plus 1 over 2c the integral from 0 to x of g of s ds. But again, this is only for x greater than 0 because these are initial solutions, these initial conditions are only given as functions for x positive. And f of x is, again, equal to 1 half f of x minus 1 over 2c integral from 0 to x g of s ds. And again, that is only for x positive. So putting this all together gives D'Alembert's solution, right? But this implies that D'Alembert only holds for x bigger than ct. Right? So the way you can think about this is if you drew out the space-time diagram. Space, time, and you draw the characteristics. x is equal to ct. So here's x is equal to ct. And then you've got another one over here. And you have all of these parallel characteristics. This is your initial uh, condition, and it's propagating like this. And then, down here, you always have D'Alembert's solution. However, there are also waves that are traveling up this way as well. Because this is the wave equation, we have backwards and forwards propagation through space. But the question is, what is happening up in here? Well, so let's actually pose this as a question. What about 
zero, which is less than X, which is less than CT, right? So what does the solution look like up in this region up here? Well, we've used the PDE to get D'Alembert's solution. We use the initial conditions to get the specific solution for D'Alembert. But the only thing we haven't used yet is the boundary condition, which sits along this line, right? So this is u equal to zero on this line. So let's use that boundary condition here. Our boundary condition tells us that we have this. And from D'Alembert's solution, this is equal to um, f of minus ct. Remember, the original solution to the equation is f of x minus ct plus g of x plus ct. At x equal to 0, I get f of minus ct plus g of positive ct. And this is you know, for all t greater than 0. OK. So really what this says is that the capital F part of the solution at some argument z has to be equal to minus g of minus z, right, for all z greater than 0. OK? So what does that actually tell us? Well. This tells us that my solution of my partial differential equation is going to look like f of x minus ct plus g of x plus ct, which is actually equal to, now let's take a look at this, g of x plus ct, that's this piece over here, and then this I'm going to replace using this right here is minus g of ct minus x, right? So just from, just from this formula right here, I can replace. Everything is now written in terms of uh, g. And from D'Alembert's solution, this gives me f of x plus ct, and then minus f of ct minus x. Now look at all of the arguments are positive now, so we don't have to worry about any issues with x being positive plus 1 over 2c, ct minus x, and then x plus ct, g of s ds. So the question is, you know, okay, we, we have an analytic expression, but, but you know, w what the heck? Does this say anything of value to us? Does it tell us anything about the equation, about the solutions? Well, here's the thing. So some commentary. One, for x greater than ct, right? So in this region, there's no boundary effects. So there's no boundary effects. OK? So that means that one, one solution is propagating to the right, one part is propagating to the left. And so here you get what we'll call like the usual waves, right? the sort of breakup of you know, left, uh, leftward and rightward propagation. Two, for x less than ct, the left moving part, left moving part, which is the g, right? So g of x plus ct here, uh, moves towards the boundary, towards the boundary, B-N-D-R-Y, just so that I don't have to uh, squeeze this in. And the boundary condition, which remember this was F plus G is equal to zero. This is sort of like a conservation law in some regard. Uh, sorry, at X equal to zero, right? This represents the G part. This is G hitting the boundary. and reflecting off to get a right moving part. Right, so what you can see here 
is that this little conservation says that, let's draw it on our, on our picture. Here we get d'Alembert. Now the G part comes flying up like this and eventually it hits the boundary and at that boundary you have this exchange. The G part can be exchanged for the F part. And so what you get now is a reflection that comes off as the F part. So what's actually happening here? Well, you initially get your right moving portion and your left moving portion. But when the left moving portion encounters the boundary, it reflects off and becomes another right moving portion. Right? So it's really sort of like a rubber boundary. And this kind of makes sense, right? If you're thinking about this as a guitar string that's pinned down, you have a wave that comes in and you can sort of think about it coming back out, right? The wave and then bouncing away. Now we can extrapolate, right? If I put another boundary at say L, what happens? Well, the right part is gonna come up and hit it and then it's gonna bounce off. And so what would you see? you would see this sort of ping-ponging back and forth, right? The, the piece comes up and hit the boundary on the right, then goes up, hits the boundary on the left. And so what you're really thinking about here, instead of a sort of oscillating little uh, guitar string, you think of a wave that flies over, hits the boundary on the right, gets bounced back, hits the boundary on the left, gets bounced back, and it's just sort of wiggling back and forth, right? So it's a very, very complicated thing to think about, but D'Alembert really tells us how to do this Analytically, right? So sometimes things are sort of hard to visualize, but mathematically they're quite simple. There wasn't a whole lot of math that we had to use here, right? Really, it was in the interpretation that, that this thing came down to. What I would like to leave for you as a little bit of a challenge is ask yourselves what happens if you have insulated boundaries, or sorry, insulated boundaries instead. So if you have a Neumann condition here. This is a much more complicated situation and it's slightly more delicate, right? So in this case, you can kind of absorb the wave coming in. Uh, but I want you to try it out. I want you to see how it works for you. For now, take a look at how we did it here. Try and extrapolate. Have a little bit of fun with this, right? So I gave you a little bit of homework. I hope that it works out for you. Uh, and in the next video, we're going to come back and we're going to look again at the first order versions of these things, the W and the V equations. And we're going to further analyze the characteristics that are showing up in there. So I'll see you all in the next video, everybody.